Well, hi everyone, John Wagner. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. I've been retired a couple of years out of Customs and Border Protection, spent a career in uh, field operations and got to work with these two uh, great guys up here with me and I dragged them in here today to talk about fentanyl and de minimis uh, and how they're related and where CBP's headed and all the great stuff that they're doing uh, with this. But Shane Campbell and Joe Dragonak, um, I'll let them introduce themselves in a minute. But, you know, Shane, I'll start with you, um, de minimis. I'm not going to ask you to spell it. <laughs> but, like, explain for everyone, including myself, what, when we say de minimis, what are we referring to and what does that mean in the context of cargo? Okay. So... If you'll excuse me, I'm not going to go into the technical trade um, vocabulary, right, and talk about Section 301, et cetera, et cetera. But essentially, um, stuff that's valued at $800 or less is allowed to come into the United States duty-free. And that's the summary of de minimis. It's, it's de minimis in its Latin term means insignificant, right? And I think that's kind of a misnomer because de minimis right now is not insignificant for CBP or for our economy. It's, it's huge for our economy. It's e-commerce. It's um, shipments to and from the United States. Um, we're not the only country that's having an issue with this. I was just in a meeting with um, last week with some members of the EU, and they're having very, very similar issues to what we are, and we're finding that with each of the countries that we engage through our efforts, de minimis is worldwide. And, Every country that we've talked to is having similar issues with it when it comes with smuggling or just circumvention of customs regulations. So, I mean, basically, I order, I order something online and it gets shipped from the foreign manufacturer right to me. Yes. Right? It doesn't go to a retailer. It doesn't get imported as a commercial importation. It comes across the border. Correct. And, it's, and that's changed the economy, right? Because now you're dealing from manufacturer to end user without warehouses and middlemen. Um, and hence, it helps because some stuff is cheaper because you don't have all those middlemen and you don't have so much transport and warehousing, et cetera. Um, however, is the person that you're working with, are they legitimate or are they not legitimate? And that's, we don't know. Right. So there, therein lies some of the risk. And, you know, the known entities in a traditional cargo transaction are, are not necessarily now involved in a transaction, and instead of, you know, one container of, of a thousand products coming in, it's a thousand individual packages coming across at CBP, all with different consignees, right? Because we all ordered something online. Yes and no, but I'm going to change something on there, which is, you know, so when we talk about those individual packages, that's I really have to caution this. It's not just packages in the mail or express consignment environments, right? Because for example, at the Port of Long Beach, at the seaport, we will get 40-foot containers full of de minimis shipments. So now you're talking about one container with thousands of de minimis shipments that's pre-labeled for postage, whether it's U.S. postage or UPS or FedEx. And those things, as soon as they're released from us, they enter the domestic stream and they go off from there. But those are all individualized transactions. It's not one big bulk transaction. Correct. Right. Correct. In terms, what are the, some of the challenges like you're seeing with the change to a, a big focus on these types of shipments coming in? Like, what's the volume coming in? So for fiscal year 23, we had over a billion shipments, de minimis shipments. Billion with a B. With a B, right? That is, that's huge. And that's, that's a lot of, like, stuff to target and to examine. Um, it, it really is. And, and our, when you ask about challenges, well, challenges come along with just – you know, the workload, right, for what we have to deal with, but also the data that goes along behind that. And I'm sure, you know, Joe will go into that a little bit too, but sometimes we're not getting the appropriate data or all of the data that we could get as we would have with prior, you know, customs type shipments. Because we knew then who the end user would be. It wasn't a billion different shipments with a billion different end users. It was much smaller for us to target, better to handle, easier to handle. Right. So, jo Joe, from your perspective working at the National Targeting Center now, like what are you seeing with, like why is why is bad data a bigger problem? And what are the risks you're seeing in this type of cargo besides the traditional stuff of, you know, counterfeits and 
IPR violations and all kinds of other agency violations. And we could talk about fake postage, right? But like, what are some of the real consequential threats you're seeing in this environment too? And how does the data relate to that? So I think it's important to understand the way CBP has really, you know, looked at from the form formulation of NTC and prior is the requirements for advanced information, advanced data to really segment risk. Uh, without that information to be able to, to identify high risk indicators or pre previous violators and put that into our targeting system to identify amongst this large stream. So you take that billion a year and just get that down to every day. Millions and millions of packages every day. Don't have enough officers to be able to go out there and examine every single package. So we really need to uh, you know, find, find that needle in a haystack, and the easiest way to do that, in our mind, is to remove the haystack. And that's with quality data to be able to apply analytics, predictive modeling, you know, people like to throw out artificial intelligence as the new norm and all that. Um, but we, it's something we've been doing for a long time, so it's contingent upon accurate data to do there. While we can look at, through post-seizure analysis, high-risk indicators and different things like that, of, of things that... Uh, you know, supply chain networks and nodes that are, are utilized to be able to identify those that may be high risk. Without that accurate da data, it's hard. And we see the gambit of everything. Um, you know, much of this large consolidated shipments and that is used to smuggle everything from forced labor through IPR, through fentanyl precursors, pill presses. Uh, we don't necessarily anymore see the finished fentanyl like we used to back in the day. It's mainly those production materials that transit through the U.S. to make their way down to production labs in Mexico. And so that's the key is CBP. I mean, we have a touch point in every part of that transportation node. And, and really, we need to be able to apply those analytics to be able to take that data and crunch down to those specific targets. Interesting. Um so as far as precursors and, you know, what, what are some of the specific trends that you could maybe share with us as to what you're seeing uh, and how, how do you hold the industry accountable to that? Because it all gets back to the data too, right? So a lot of what we've seen in the precursor world, of, of course, you know, a lot of the, the, the production materials overseas in, in China and the other locations on there, predominantly in China. And just the way the supply chain networks work, uh, much of that freight transits through other countries. A lot of this is, you know, post-COVID where there weren't a lot of direct from China flights to the U.S. at the time. So you saw a lot transiting through South Korea and other locations on there. This is where our partnerships are key. Our industry partnerships, our international partnerships, and our uh, other law enforcement and domestic partnerships. Uh, but then they would come into the U.S., like Shane said. So you have these large consolidated shipments. I wish I had a picture. Uh, so one multiple pallets could be anywhere from 800 to 20,000 boxes in one consolidated shipment on, under one bill of lading. And then in those boxes, you open up those boxes, it's like the nesting doll. You know, you open up a box, there's another box. You open up a box, there's another box. And all those have pre-printed labels. So as soon as they deconsolidate that shipment, they scan it in and it hits that domestic stream of commerce. So it's really, ra it's that rapid moving to understand that not we can't intercept, we can't examine everything. That freight needs to move quickly. The time it takes on there, so without that information, it's key. And that's where we go back to our industry partners too to say if we aren't getting accurate information and data and what we're required under the legislation and law, how do you know what's in your planes? Like, how do you know what's on your ships? How do you know what's in there? That like, really, we need to work together to kind of better understand, to protect that aircraft, to protect that ship, to protect what's coming in and protect ultimately protect the American people. Uh, so that's key to really get industry to, to understand the self-regulation piece on this and really at the end of the day, the ownership of that. So the boxes within the box are not manifested. Correct. So many times we will not see the true parties it's going to. Shane talked about right. de minimis where the requirement is that end user. And many times we don't necessarily see that on there. So that's where we look for other discrepancies in the data that we can apply predictive modeling and other stuff to be able to identify. So someone just takes the box, opens it up, dumps it into the mailbox and all the other sub packages get delivered. But you don't have visibility into no, what, it, what was in those originally, right? Correct, and that's where working with many of those what we call last mile carriers, those that once that package is scanned gets put on a FedEx, UPS, 
postal, DHL, whatever truck on there and gets delivered to that end user, that's where we have to collaborate with industry as well to kind of identify how these supply chain networks. And then once we latch on to a certain illicit supply chain network, guess what? It's changing. This is where using intelligence and other information to be able to predict those shifts in supply chain patterns is key. Right. So Shane, like you know, Joe mentioned the industry partnerships and yeah. so what role can industry play in this? What what's the expectations the government levies on them? I mean, you got brokers, you got airlines, you got transportation entities, but their customers are telling them, hey, this is one box. There's not ten inside here. Right. Well, or <laughs> or more, right? So um, I literally just left a meeting with one of our partners who is one of the end shippers and they were describing how this impacts their business too because they get a phone call and, and they are told, hey, we have 5,000 boxes that you need to come pick up because they're waiting for you XYZ company to come pick these up and ship them and they have no idea, they have pre, no pre-notice this is coming and suddenly they're trying to round up semi-trucks to go pick up these de minimis shipments to bring them someplace else. That so. It doesn't just impact us at CBP. It, there's a huge impact along the supply chain. So the best thing that I can say, or the easiest way I can sum it up, is you have to know who you're doing business with, and you have to understand what their what their business actually is, so that you know when you're when you see something, whether you're taking it as a broker, you're taking it as a carrier, you're doing the final shipping. You know what it is that you're putting in your plane, on your boat, in your truck, wherever it is, right? Because you, there is a reputational risk that goes along with that too. Along with the national security risk, there's the reputational risk for these industries because you don't want to be associated with bad stuff, right? You don't want it for your reputation, your stakeholders, your bottom line profit margin, right? So I, I think there's, there's ways that we could step up and partner together. And that's what we're looking for is how do we, how do we better share information with you with our trade holders, with our trade partners, but also how do we get information from our trade partners too? Because there's a lot of data and intel that really could help, I'm gonna pick on Joe, Joe's team in their targeting aspect, right? But also our ports of entry and our ports of entry and others so that they can better figure out what it is that they need to look at. One billion is a big number. That's a lot of boxes to have to open up. And so we'd rather not- It's good all the time. Yeah, right? <laughs> I'm in. Um, rather not have to do that, but rather let's let's focus on the true targets that we have, but we have to whittle through that. And it's easier to do that with data, right? And I mean, CBP's got great history with the CTPAT program, right? And being able to have the known entities document their supply chains, secure their supply chains. It gives CBP reach into entities they don't necessarily directly regulate through that. And you incentivize the industry to take these extra measures and you know secure that supply chain and you know remove some of the rotten hay from the haystack so it's yeah. smaller. Yeah, you right? do. You do. It's a it, it's a great program. So currently over ten thousand members within the CTPAT program, um, and we help with those with those entities. We do validation, so we go and we interview folks. We see their facilities. We help them um, realize some best practices that we know as an entity but also that other other folks within their industry know. So if you're a shipping company, we can help share some of the best practices from shipping company to shipping company under the CTPAT program so that we can help better secure the supply chain. And that's the key, is that, and that's what I mean when I say know who you're doing business with, that's securing the supply chain, which is good for us. Any, are you seeing any, anything the industry's doing that is particularly helpful or you know, what are the gaps you see that the industry can help fill? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll ask that to both of you, but, you know, start with you. What do you see, what's going, what's, what's the industry response been to a lot of this? Because I know CBP has been opening a lot more packages and cracking down on a lot of stuff and yeah. seeing, you know, the, some of the, the, just the bad data that you're getting. Right. And the, you know, we could talk post office too, but the counterfeit postage, Right on a lot of these <laughs> these boxes too. It's like this whole just world of, and because it's under this like guise of de minimis. What did it translate to again, in Latin? Insignificant. Insignificant, yeah. right? But it's not, yeah. right? We should have named it better. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I have to roll that. So there's a lot of stuff that industry can and is doing, right? Information sharing is number one. Um, and when you talk about crackdowns, right, as, as we go and we find certain trends, 
um, we do our best to work with our partners to let them know about these trends so that they can help clean up their part of the supply chain, right? To let them know that, hey, here's a risk here, right? So I think if that information share, sharing is key, right? But some partners on their own are going into pre-screening, right? Which is hugely successful where that's being piloted and where that's being tested. Um, so I think that could be a key in this part too. Um, but really knowing and, and taking that look, I think education as we share trends for that industry to share that amongst their employees. I'll give you an example that we like to use, which is the pen, right? A common pen, right? So if you're shipping a pen or if you're a broker and you get a shipment for a pen and it's one pen, but it weighs 50 kilograms and it's valued at a dollar, there might be something more to that one pen shipment, right? But that's the type of, that we look at it from a CBP perspective, from an officer perspective, and we say, wow, that's a really hit, right? But yet it missed all sorts of levels amongst that supply chain to where nobody even asked, well, is it the world's largest pen? What's wrong, <laughs> what's the, is it gold? What's wrong with this pen, right? But it's just a pen. And, you know, that's where we find stuff. And at some point, postage was paid. Yes. So is it a stamp on there, or is it? <laughs> or is it just right? a piece of paper with sticky stuff behind it, right. and a nice little picture, right. like crayon in? Yeah. Right? yeah. So there's, there's pieces of data out there, right? It's, it's what's the right data to give CBP, but what's the right data the industry should be looking at to, to do their you know due diligence. So I think it's verifying that data that you're giving to CBP, right? And when you see something that's outrageous, and I am using an outrageous example, but it's a real example, and it's multiplied over and over and over again with different commodities. So if you see something and you just take a second to think about it, say, well, that's kind of weird, ask a few questions, you know? Call, call the person who that shipment originated from. Call the broker, you know, look. Yeah, if you have the authority amongst your own supply chain area, then take a look at the box, take a look at what it is that's being shipped and see is this what my client is telling me? Because like I said, if it's not, and we talk in the context of, in this forum, fentanyl and narcotics, right? But it is the Homeland Security Defense Forum. And if it's something beyond narcotics, do you really want that on your mode of transportation? Do you want that sitting in your warehouse? Do you, do you want to be associated with that? Right. Yeah, a little homework. So, um, you know, I'm fortunate enough to, to be able to lead CVP's counter fentanyl and synthetic strategy and implementation of that. And really, that, our strategy is, is focused on a couple of key factors, enhancing our partnerships, increasing our information sharing amongst international industry, state and local, and federal partners, taking intelligence and information to drive our strategic operations. That's really the strategy on there. And what, what Shane mentioned and talked about is really we to also have ownership to go back and share some, some trends with industry to help them keep up to speed on, on those shifting smuggling trends and those supply chains on there. So we've really focused on, on that piece to be able, as we see those things in there, so they can go back helping them build internally. Many of these main industry partners have their own targeting capabilities. They have their security departments. And how can we help them and work together to be able to be that force multiplier? Really, I, I think a lot of how we started with this to go back to industry to the table is we, we launched this, this very successful strategic operation that, that, that we've, we've provided information on last year, Operation Artemis which really stemmed from some intelligence information on what we felt the illicit supply chain of precursor chemicals was and putting a lot of uh, uh, um, personnel to attack that problem set of really going into these warehouses and just start tearing boxes open. And, and in essence, slowing the supply chain down to, for us to understand the problem set. And then to go back to industry and says, now we've got empirical data. We know what the problem set is. We know where, where, where the challenges are. Now let's work together to be able as a government and industry to solve this problem. And that's really what we've done at this point and a lot of what Shane talked about, to share that information to say, okay, here's our proposal, how we can work together to solve this problem. That's right. Any, like, from what you're trying to do there at the targeting center and bringing in, you know, different agencies, different databases, different data sets, you know, trying to help the officers on the front lines make the best decisions that they can, right, based on all this reach that the government has to, you know, assess risk and different things. Like, what, what are some of the things you might need 
um, you know, if if you can think of anything off the off the top of your head, like what's what are the, some of the gaps and or what would help you? More people and money. <laughs> Besides more people and <laughs> Isn't money. Isn't that always what everybody needs? No. <laughs> um, in all honesty, I think a couple of things we really need as we start ingesting more of this data. How do, how do we use machine learning, machine reasoning to be able to identify those specific trend, outline trends like, like Shane described ahead of it? Not after we get a seizure, but how do we detect those anomalies in the data, understanding we're not always going to get 100% accurate data? And then how do we uh, equip our officers in the field, in the locations, to be able to use certain technology to better detect? And, and the example I like to give on there is, you know, we, we've got uh, our canines. I'm a huge dog lover. Uh, I think canines are tremendous in what they can do. I think we can kind of understand that a little better and how do we apply it to technology. Like, I would love, it's nothing out there now, so I'm challenging all, all, all the partners in there. I would love if an officer could have a handheld unit walk through a warehouse amongst one of these consolidated shipments and just walk right by and have some type of technology that can determine if there's a chemical signature for a fentanyl precursor in one of those boxes. Nothing out there, but that's the kind of thing. We have canines that walk around these, these packages to be able to detect the odor of, of narcotics. Things we're exploring, can we, can we upload fentanyl precursors into a canine to be able to, to do that? But how can we use, we've got technology can, that, that can detect a chemical signature, but you gotta take a sample or you gotta be right on there, it has to be pure. But those are the things we need to look four or five years down the line, and not just for fentanyl, there's gonna be another synthetic going to be another drug out there. This is a problem set we will continue to try to attack. But those are the things where those out the bo outside the box thinking to understand that how do we be able to look at these large e-commerce that, that sp at the speed of mission uh, to be able to detect that because it's not going away. E-commerce is just going to continue to expand and expand because that's just the way uh, uh, we're going to be doing business in the future. Okay. Thanks. Um, let me open it up for... Any questions or, or comments? If if we have any, if not, we'll just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> as far as testing labs, on, in Tom. terms of those of us... In view of the variety of industry representatives here, do you have a point of contact for lab where we can present different candidates for your consideration because you know there are several out there. The non-intrusive inspections, we know the varieties there, but scaling them down for what you're describing, the walkthrough inspection, as opposed to the hard uh, detectors that are at the ports of entry, et cetera. But do, do you have lab support for that kind of evaluation? Um, so I, we've been working rather extensively with, with DHS, the science and technology of kind of, and, and I've been in a couple of forums like this of, of really, th that's been the inject point of that, let's that advanced thinking that let's, let's try to see what else is out there or try to develop something in the future. So that's really been that inject point is through DHS, s &T, who directly collaborates with me and my team and kind of, and brings, brings whoever is presenting in for, for briefings and that. So I would start kind of there and that aspect on there. And then, you know, one thing you did, you, you did kind of mention, we've been really looking at, and, and you know, CBP's got a very robust laboratory and scientific services. We've got our LSS, we've got Ford operating labs. We've been consolidating into a joint lab with DEA and FDA called Intrepid. And we really want to use the scientific data to drive our strategic operations. As we start dissecting those pills, the analogs, the uh, um, um, adulterants and other things like that, we always look for those obscure items kind of outside the norm that help formulate that, sp that specific pill so we can start tracking the movement of those production materials. So we want science to drive our enforcement actions as well as intelligence. Thank you. It, I would encourage you to go to every person you know then in CVP, right? Like just don't yeah. try one, one path. Um, you know, sometimes it's just finding the right champion inside one of these organizations that will take it and run through the bureaucracy, you know, with it to do those kinds of things. Any other questions? Nothing. Oh, here we go. Um, Rebecca from the Associated Press. Can you just give an idea of how much of these de, de minimis <laughs> um, packages, how have they increased over the years? Like, do you have some, just some general idea, like over the last five, 10 years, just to kind of get a trend? 
I all, so off the top of my head, I want to say they've almost doubled over the past like year or two, but I, do, I can get you that afterwards, but I don't have it off, but I know it's significantly more year over year to where we finally broke the billion point last year. It, it's pretty exponential growth in the last few years. I mean, a couple things, right? Just, you know, e-commerce business model, the pandemic, um, all these factors, um, the changes in the law, which allowed the de minimis provision. And I think some really smart logistics people that figured out how to get it from the manufacturer to my, my front stoop. Right. Right. And I don't even have to go to the store now to buy anything. Um, but just all the logistics that go on and all the different entities that are involved in that and, you know, bringing a product to, to your doorstep. Um, you know, now it's just trying to figure out how does that fit within some of the, the, the regulatory and legal controls of, of the border agencies and then what are some of the challenges of what they're trying to do with the border and these groups that are exploiting, you know, the, 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 the different methods to get, you know, their products through the border and you know, into the U.S. So it's, it's, a, it's a new challenge, but, you know, CBP has always risen to these different challenges over the years. And I think Joe mentioned, you know, if today it's fentanyl, tomorrow it'll be a different, right? you know, type of chemical and, you know, just always trying to stay creative and ahead of that and, and continue to, to, to challenge yourselves to, to, to do that. And if, if I can just throw in too, right? I mean, COVID changed the American consumer, right? And we're very habit oriented. And so as we got used to, to even have groceries delivered to our doors, right? And I think I'm like one of the last people in my neighborhood that doesn't do that. Um, you know, that's, yeah, folks more and more rely on, like John said, boxes just being at their door when they come home. And, you know, I know I'll have 20 today because I've already got my alerts. Christmas <laughs> 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 shopping's done, right? So, yeah, we all, I mean, that's, that's how we function now. Anyone else in our uh, closing minutes? Probably have time for one more. You know, I think, that, you know, Shane brings up kind of a good point that we can't lose besides looking at the supply chain is just the online marketplaces as well as in the tech industry and kind of how that is, is, is being exploited and utilized too is not just lose focus. Well, we may not have a, a regulatory or oversight kind of piece in that. That is the entranceway into procurement of much of this, these materials to produce synthetic drugs is through online marketplaces and different kind of online vendors. Um, not necessarily the big vendors, but there's, there's, there's just networks out there everywhere. And it's, it's, not, it's not like you're going on the dark web and, and all that. I mean, you can, you, there, there's these easy vendors to be able to procure these chemicals and other things online. So, you know, with that, I'll just, you know, in closing, I, we see the, the changes in, in the statutes, um, you know, leads to some different challenges for CBP as far as the volume of a these de minimis packages, but these are not insignificant. Um, and what, what would traditionally come through the border in like bulk quantities are now coming in as individual transactions. And, you know, there's a need for accurate data, advanced accurate data. There's a need to be able to target and identify what's good and what's bad and what needs to be um, checked at the border and what can be expedited through. And, you know, there's a lot of industry partnerships that can be leveraged to help because there's a lot of different entities now involved in, in these types of transactions from marketplaces to, um, you know, consolidators to shippers to, you know, foreign warehousers and who fulfills the, the product and who files the, the data with CBP. Um, you know, so there's, there's some different entities involved and, you know, through those industry partnerships, you can leverage some type of you know, control over them or influence over them to, you know, and a lot of times they may not even know what they're doing, right, might be, right. You, you know, might be problematic and helping educate them so they can know and they can be, you know, you know, better customers of the government too. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad you two uh, fellows are involved in it. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's great to have you there and doing really some of this uh, really cutting edge stuff that you're doing with the technology and the data analytics and, you know, some of the work that you're doing. So thank both of you for all that you're doing and uh, thank to all of you for having us here today to talk about it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks.